This lecture is on conformations and their applications, part two. Sometimes it's useful to design molecules where the conformations are locked. This is called conformational constraint. Locking conformations with double bonds or rings is useful for understanding the biological or medicinal significance of conformers. For example, we might want to design a ligand, which is a small attaching molecule, to selectively bind to the GABA C receptor, which is a protein target of ligand attachment. All GABA receptors bind the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA. What does GABA do? GABA increases the chloride uptake in nerves, which blocks nerve conduction. Each GABA receptor subtype, A, B, or C, may bind to GABA differently since they also bind different ligands. Let's take a look at three ligands. Each selectively binds to one GABA receptor subtype. We have Valium, Baclofen, and Cis-4-Amino Crotonic Acid. Each of these ligands is a GABA receptor agonist, meaning that each inhibits nerve firing like GABA does, but each binds selectively to a GABA receptor subtype. Valium, a sedative, selectively binds to the GABA A receptor. Baclofen, an antispasmodic agent and alcohol withdrawal treatment, selectively binds to the GABA B receptor. And finally, cis 4 aminocrotonic acid is a biochemical tool that selectively binds to the GABA C receptor. Unlike the GABA A and GABA B receptor subtypes, the GABA C receptor subtype is not very well understood so its physiological role is not well defined. In order to study it, you need to make conformationally constrained versions of GABA. So, what GABA conformation does the GABA C receptor prefer? It turns out that GABA C likes to bind to cis 4 aminocrotonic acid, but very poorly binds to trans 4 aminocrotonic acid. If we look at the corresponding conformation of GABA that matches that locked or constrained conformation of those two isomers, you see that the preferred conformation is the folded GABA conformation, in which you see that the amino group and the carboxylate group are eclipsed, whereas the poorly binding conformation of GABA is the extended GABA conformation in which the amino group and the carboxylate group are staggered or anti. Here is a GABA C selective agonist using a ring instead of a double bond to lock the conformation. You can see that the folded GABA conformation is what is preferred when you lock the ring in such a way that the amino group and the carboxylate group are cis to each other. And the pictures below also show even more clearly how the folded conformation of GABA on the left looks very much like this conformationally constrained analog on the right. Practice problem three. Which of the following compounds is likely to be a selective GABA C agonist? Explain. Remember the GABA C agonist should look like a folded conformation of GABA. At this point you want to pause the video in order for you to work on the practice problem. Answer to practice problem 3. With structure A, the amino group and the carboxyl group are in a folded conformation that's locked, so that matches the folded GABA conformation, and thus compound A should be a GABA C agonist. With compound B, it looks initially like it's correctly folded, but if you compare it to what GABA would look like with the amino group coming towards you and the carboxyl group going away from you, this doesn't match the folded GABA conformation because the amino and carboxyl groups are gauche instead of eclipsed. So this is not likely to be a selective GABA C agonist, although it may have some binding. And in compound C, we can be fooled by thinking, oh yeah, you know, here are the amino groups and the carboxyl groups, they're cis to each other, so this should be a folded uh, conformation of GABA in a locked arrangement, but if you actually look at it, 
GABA is not as long as the uh, molecule is in terms of the distance between the carboxyl group and the amino group. The ex this is also really an extended conformation of GABA. It's not ex actually what you're looking for. It's too long and is an extended conformation. It's not likely to be a GABA C agonist. Now that we've seen how rings can be used for designing conformationally constrained compounds, let's look at cyclic compounds in general. When rings are less than six membered, then you get torsional strain and angle strain from bond angles that are smaller than 109.5 degrees. For example, the cyclopropane, the torsional strain comes from the fact that all of the CH bonds on the top and on the bottom are overlapping. They're all eclipsed. The angle strain comes from the fact that the ring is so small that the bond angle is 60 degrees, much smaller than the expected 109.5 degrees for sp3 hybridized carbon. For rings that are greater than six membered, there is mostly angle strain from bond angles that are larger than 109.5 degrees. For example, in cyclooctane, you see that there are bond angles of 112.4 degrees and 112.9 degrees, both of which are much larger than the expected 109.5 degrees for sp3 hybridized carbon. Once you make a ring out of a chain, two things can happen. You can get torsional strain from adjacent eclipsing bonds. That is, there's one bond in front of the other. There's a zero degree dihedral angle or close to that. You can get angle strain from bond angles deviating from ideal. In the case of sp3 hybridized carbon, the ideal bond angle is 109.5 degrees. So bond angles that are smaller than this or larger than this deviate from the ideal and therefore create angle strain. Torsional strain plus angle strain in a ring is equal to ring strain. So if you look at the correlation between ring size and ring strain in kilocalories per mole, you see that the highest ring strain is found in the three-membered ring cyclopropane, 27.6 kcal per mole. Then as you increase the ring size, the ring strain decreases until you get to the six-membered ring, which has no ring strain. As the ring size increases above six-membered, there is in additional ring strain. You notice for cycloheptane it's 6.3 kcal per mole, and for cyclooctane it's 9.6 kcal per mole. That's because of mostly deviation from ideal bond angles. So that's mostly coming from angle strain. Regarding the six-membered ring, it is actually the chair conformer of cyclohexane without any substituents that has no ring strain. There's no torsional strain. They're all staggered adjacent bonds. And there's no angle strain. All the bonds inside the ring and all the bonds around the ring are 109.5 degree perfect bond angles for sp3 hybridized carbon. And there are two types of bonds on chair cyclohexane. There are six bonds that go straight up and down that are called axial, or abbreviated AX. And there are six equatorial bonds that go out to the sides, and that's abbreviated EQ. The red bonds straight up and down are axial, and the ones going out to the side, pointing slightly up or down, are equatorial. If you replace H, a hydrogen atom, with another atom or group, X, and there's a rapid interconversion of two chair conformers, one exists with X in the equatorial position, the other exists with X in the axial position. And that's because the twisting of the chair conformation or conformer from one chair into the other, when that chair twisting occurs, a group X that is equatorial becomes axial and vice versa. X in the axial position, that is any substituent in the axial position, 
is less stable than X in the equatorial position because of steric repulsion with hydrogen atoms on two axial CH bonds, which are two bonds away. This is called 1-3 diaxial interaction. So if you look at X in the equatorial position, it's in good shape. There's no steric strain, and that's more stable. But when X is in the axial position, it's going to bump into hydrogen atoms, which are at position 3. That is, if X is in the axial group uh, is at position 1, there is a 1-3 diaxial interaction between that X group and the hydrogens that are on carbon 3. This is less stable because there are two 1-3 diaxial XH interactions causing steric strain. When the X group that is axial is terbutyl, the chair conformation becomes locked with terbutyl equatorial. The reason for that is terbutyl is so large that it's too big to be axial. When it tries to collide in the axial position with those hydrogen atoms at carbon 3, it interpenetrates so much that the energy is increased to such a great extent that it is unacceptably large. So therefore, the third butyl group must remain in the equatorial position. Okay, let's look at how to draw substituted chair cyclohexane conformers. First, draw the chair conformers of the bare ring with no substituents. For one conformer, you have looks like a beak pointing down, two parallel lines, and a beak pointing up. And you fuse these together. For the other conform conformer, you have a beak that points up, two parallel lines again, and a beak that points down, and you fuse those together. Now secondly, we need to know where the axial and equatorial bonds go. Axial bonds point straight up and straight down. And they come off of the intersection of bonds in the ring, look like a V. The equatorial bonds point slightly up and slightly down, and they're going to point to the right or to the left. So in our first chair conformer, if you look at the little pink Vs at the intersection of bond lines, you can see the, where the axial bonds point straight up and straight down. The corresponding equatorial bonds are going to point in the opposite sense of the axial bonds. So, if you have equatorial bonds that are coming off of carbons with axial bonds pointing straight up, the equatorial bonds will point slightly down. However, what direction left or right do they point? That depends on what side of the ring they're on. If you split the ring evenly, three carbons on the left and three carbons on the right, if you have an axial bond pointing straight up, the corresponding equatorial bond will point slightly down and to the left. If you have an axial point bond that's pointing straight down and it's on the left side, then the equatorial bond will point slightly up and to the left. Correspondingly, if you're on the right side of the ring, you have an axial bond pointing straight up, then the X equatorial bond will point slightly down and to the right. And if you have an axial bond pointing straight down and it's on the right side of the ring, then the equatorial bond will point slightly up and to the right. Typically, you're going to be given a flat drawing of substituted cyclohexane. You need to be able to convert it into a cyclohexane drawing that is a chair conformer. In the flat picture, the wedge bonds equal up and the dash bonds equal down. But you don't know whether or not those up or down bonds are axial or equatorial. That depends on where you put them on the ring. For example, if you look at this dye substituted flat picture of cyclohexane. We have a methyl group, which is a wedge bond, so that's pointing up, and an ethyl group, which is a dash bond, so that's pointing down. If you look at our first chair conformer with these substituents on it, I will arbitrarily place the methyl group at that bottom 
corner, it's like a beak, and there are two bonds there, right? There's a bond that points down, which is axial, and then the corresponding bond that points up to the left, which is equatorial. Well, I want the bond that points up, so that means that my methyl group at that position is equatorial. Now, if I go to the back, position 2, I want to place my ethyl group there. Now, that ethyl group should be pointing down. The axial bond at that position points straight up, so I don't want that. So, the, so I need to use the equatorial bond, which points down. So that means at position 1, I have an equatorial methyl, and at position 2, I have an equatorial ethyl. Now, if you twist this chair conformer into its other conformer form, remember that equatorial becomes axial, and axial becomes equatorial. So, the original equatorial methyl at position 1 is now an axial methyl, and the equatorial ethyl at position 2 is now an axial ethyl. Well, this is less stable than the, the original conformer, because now we have two ethyl hydrogen and two methyl hydrogen 1-3 diaxial interactions, which create a lot of steric strain. The most stable chair conformer is always the one that has the least steric strain, caused by 1-3 diaxial interactions. Hopefully, no steric strain. A larger group creates more steric strain than a smaller group. And the steric strain from two axial groups, larger than hydrogen, creates the most steric strain. Practice problem four. Draw both chair conformers of each compound and indicate which conformer is more stable and why. The most stable conformer is the one with the least amount of steric strain, which would mean the least amount of 1-3 diaxial interaction. At this point, you want to pause the video in order for you to work on the practice problem. Answers to practice problem four. In part A, we have two substituents. We have a methyl group pointing up at position one, an isopropyl group pointing down at position three. In our first conformer, we see that the methyl group at position one has to be equatorial in order for it to point up, and at position three, the isopropyl group has to be axial in order to point down. The other conformer requires that we change from equatorial to axial and axial to equatorial. So the methyl group at position 1 is now axial, still pointing up, and the isopropyl group is equatorial, pointing down. The more stable conformer would be the second one, because we have methyl hydrogen 1-3 diaxial interactions which produce less steric strain than those from the larger isopropyl group. In part B, we have two ethyl groups at positions 1 and 3 and they're both pointing up. So if we look at the first chair conformer, position 1 we have the ethyl group pointing up in the equatorial position. In position 3 we have the second ethyl group also pointing up and equatorial. And if we form the second conformer, both of these equatorial ethyls now have to become axial, and they're still pointing up. The first conformer is more stable because there are no 1-3 diaxial interactions. In part C, we have an ethyl substituent and a tert-butyl substituent, and they're both pointing up. So if you look at the first chair conformer, the ethyl group at position 1 would have to be equatorial to point up, and the tert butyl group at position 4 would have to be axial to point up. Now, we know the tert butyl is too big to be in the axial position, so the only real conformer that can exist is the other conformer, in which the tert butyl group is equatorial, still pointing up, and the ethyl group is axial pointing up. And our explanation is that the more stable conformer must have the tert butyl group in the equatorial position. It's too big to be axial because that creates too much 1-3 diaxial strain. Regarding the E2 reaction on rings, on six-membered rings, the alpha-CL bond 
in order to L is the leaving group, and the beta CH bonds must both be axial to be anti paraplanar. One bond's a wedge, and the other's a dash. So, for example, you see in this structure that the bromine is towards you, and the methyl that's adjacent is away from you. That means that you have two beta hydrogen opportunities, but only one of them is going to work. On the left, you have a beta hydrogen which can be anti paraplanar and it allows E2. But on the right, the beta hydrogen is pointing in the same direction as the bromine, the leaving group. So that's not anti paraplanar, so there's no E2 in that orientation. Thus, the tert-butoxide base can only cause E2 on the left side. Only tert-butyl group can cause trouble. You must draw the chair conformer with tert-butyl equatorial to decide if you have an anti-paraplanar case. So in the example shown below, the tert-butyl and the leaving group are trans to each other. You first have to draw the chair conformer, and that chair conformer must give the tert butyl group an equatorial position. If you do that, you'll see that the chlorine, the leaving group, is not going to be in an orientation that will allow anti paraplanar geometry. It's equatorial. This locked conformer does not allow E2. In bicyclic rings, you can have, because of their rigidity, thin paraplanar alpha carbon to leaving group bonds and beta carbon to hydrogen bonds, which allow E2 to occur with a strong base. In the example shown below, you have an alpha carbon to bromine bond and a beta carbon to hydrogen bond, which are syn paraplanar. That is, the CBR bond and the CH bond occupy the same plane and they're pointing in the same direction. The phoxide acts as the strong base and you get an E2 reaction generating an alkene. In an alkene, in which you have anti or syn paraplanar alpha carbon to leaving group bonds and beta carbon to hydrogen bonds, E2 occurs with a strong base in either case. At this point, you want to pause the video in order for you to work on the practice problem. Practice problem five. Predict the product or products of the following E2 reactions. Show the mechanism and indicate if the geometry is anti-paraplanar or syn-paraplanar. If no reaction occurs, explain. Answers to practice problem five. In part A, we have a bicyclic system with an alpha carbon to leaving group bond and a beta carbon to hydrogen bond, which is shown in red. The leaving group is a tosylate, which is one of the sulfonates, and tert-butoxide is the strong base. Those two bonds, the alpha carbon to leaving group bond and the beta carbon to hydrogen bond, are syn periplanar, and we generate an alkene. In part B, we have a situation in which there are the same alpha carbon to leaving group and beta carbon to hydrogen bonds, but their orientations don't allow you to have a syn periplanar geometry. Since these two groups are no longer syn periplanar, the strong base, tert-butoxide, cannot cause the formation of a double bond. You can't get E2. You need either syn or anti paraplanar geometry on a rigid system, and neither exists in this case. In part C, we still have tert-butoxide as our strong base, but now we have an alpha carbon to bromine bond and two different situations where we have beta carbon to hydrogen bonds. In situation one, that beta CH bond is anti paraplanar to the alpha CBR bond, and in situation two, we have a beta CH bond which is syn paraplanar due to, the, due to the rigidity of the carbon-carbon double bond with our alpha CBR bond. 
so we have both anti-paraplanar and send paraplanar geometry for E2. So in situation one, the anti-paraplanar case, we get two fused double bonds, known as an alene. And in situation two, we get an alkyne from our E2 reaction. Saturated heterocycles. Rings containing atoms other than carbon are called heterocycles. Examples include pyridine and piperidine, which are six-sided rings that incorporate nitrogen instead of carbon, and furan and tetrahydrofuran, which are five-sided rings incorporating oxygen instead of carbon. Saturated heterocycles have no pi bonds in the ring. Examples include piperidine and tetrahydrofuran. In six-membered saturated rings containing oxygen or nitrogen, the chair conformer is most stable and twists into two forms. In the example on the left, we have an oxygen-containing ring in which the, the methyl group is axial in the first structure, and that twists into the equatorial position in the second structure. In the example on the right, we have a nitrogen-containing ring in which the methyl group is axial and that twists into an equatorial methyl in the second structure. And also note that the lone pair on the nitrogen transforms from equatorial to axial. Unless locked in fused rings, the lone pair on sp3 hybridized nitrogen inverts so that it can switch from equatorial to axial without changing the ring. In the example shown on the far left, you can see that the actual ring doesn't change at all, but the nitrogen lone pair inverts, which forces the methyl group to go from axial to equatorial. When the lone pair on nitrogen is axial, that's the most stable orientation. In the middle structure, we have the nitrogen in a fused position. No inversion is possible because the lone pair can't fit inside the ring. And in the example to the far right, there is also no inversion. Ring fusion prevents ring twisting, which is needed for the uh, lone pair to be able to invert. Opiates, powerful painkillers. Opiates are compounds based on morphine, a powerful and addictive painkiller, or analgesic. You see in the structure of morphine, there's a nitrogen whose lone pair prefers to be in the axial position. Via a hydrogen bond to the axial sp3 nitrogen lone pair, all opiates bind to the mu receptor, a giant protein, in nerve cells, diminishing pain sensation. Morphine-like analgesics must all have the same core structure inducing the desired medicinal effect. This is called the pharmacophore. As you can see in the structure shown below, the pharmacophore contains the axial lone pair on nitrogen in a six-membered ring furthest from an anti-2 that is diagonally across from the benzene ring. That pharmacophore is shown in red. Practice problem six. Which of the following compounds is likely to be an analgesic? Explain your choice and your reasons for rejecting the other choices. Remember that the nitrogen's lone pair must be axial and in a six-sided ring, and that axial lone pair must be anti-2, that is diagonally across from, a benzene ring. At this point, you want to pause the video in order for you to work on the practice problem. Answers to practice problem six. Structure A is not an analgesic. Although there is an axial lone pair on nitrogen, nitrogen is not furthest from the benzene ring, and the lone pair is not anti, i.e. 180 degrees, from the benzene ring. Structure B is an analgesic. Inversion of the lone pair makes it axial. Axial lone pair on nitrogen in a six-membered ring furthest from and anti to the benzene ring, 
matches the opiate pharmacophore. This compound is Demerol, otherwise known as meperidine, a prescription opiate analgesic. Structure C is not an analgesic. The lone pair can't invert to axial position because of ring fusion.